About four years ago, Alex O'Connor interviewed me for his Cosmic Skeptic podcast. Recently, I invited him back to appear on The Poetry of Reality. We agreed that the conversation should appear on both our channels. We talked about Ayan Hirsi Ali's apparent conversion, Jordan Peterson, whether the God delusion should have spent more than a few pages on the works of theologians, fear of death, and other topics. We're both atheists, but Alex did his Oxford degree in theology, which I think makes for an interesting conversation. I hope you agree. Alex O'Connor, welcome to The Poetry of Reality. Can you summarize in one minute where you come from and what, you're, what you are? Well, it all started when my parents met at a bar. No, not really. Um, it's, lo- it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm a, I'm a YouTuber, although that can be something of a, of a dirty term with a, with a reputation for uh, be, being some kind of Jake Paul type figure. I, I consider myself more of a podcaster these days. I grew out of the tradition of, of new atheism inspired by works such as your own and those of the, of the new atheists. Uh, these days, I see myself as more of a conversationalist trying to talk to people across the aisle, as it were, about the topics of religion and philosophy and ethics. I just wanted to ask you, in your interviewing style, do you adopt a kind of adversarial devil's advocate position? Adversarial sometimes, but never to the point of being rude, at least as far as I can help. I've noticed that. When it comes to, well, you can ask Peter Hitchens, he has a different opinion. Um... When it comes to being devil's advocate, I find that I'm, I'm more often than not actually playing God's advocate in that I'm talking to atheist colleagues and friends. I didn't really mean in that sense. I meant, are, are, do you saying put a that, point of view uh, opposite to your uh, person you're interviewing for the sake of keeping the conversation going? Or do you agree certainly. with them when you do agree with them? I, I will let them know that I agree with them, but hopefully still ask a question that people want to have asked. I, it can be, so, there have been times when it's been confused, where it seems like I've been putting forward, uh, put, putting forward a position of my own and what I've really been doing is still playing a role that, that it's, it's not quite clear. And I actually consider it as a sign of a success of an interview when half of the comments are lambasting me for views that I don't hold. I think it means that I've done my job as an interviewer convincingly and done it well. I am Hersey Ali recently, despite you being perhaps the world's most famous atheist, described you as one of the most Christian people that she knows. Why did she say that? I adore Ayan. Um, I'm, I'm a great fan of hers. I've, I have talked to her about this. Uh, I think the, the respect in which we differ is that for me, what really matters is the truth claims of Christianity. And for her, what really matters is the morality uh, the politics, actually. Um, I think for her, Christianity is a bastion against something worse. As Hilaire Belloc said, always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. And for her, I think she, she wants a, a faith which will help people to stand up against worse faiths. And she singles out uh, Islam, she singles out China, I think, and Putin and Wokeism. Wokeism, yes. Um, and um, I'm with her on, on all those. And uh, to the extent that I think that a religion might be valuable for political reasons, I would go along with her. But I think it's the wrong way to approach religion. I think that what really matters about a religion is whether it's true. And to adopt a religion for, uh, it's almost as though one is saying, well, I don't believe this nonsense, but it's a very good idea if other people do. And there's something patronizing about that. She doesn't do that. She goes, she, she says, I believe in it. I, I am a Christian. Um, and therefore, it's not patronizing. But I think the, the fundamental motivation is a political and a moral one. I, I presume as both an atheist and as a person with an understanding of not just biological, but also mimetic evolution, having coined the term meme, you'll have to think of religion as essentially something which serves some kind of social function. That, that must be why it exists. That's why it evolved. Given that that's the case, is it really so inappropriate to think about religion in terms of how it serves us socially? If that, fr- from our uh, shared worldview, must be what religion really is. From an academic point of view, I think it's a very interesting question, what religion is all about, what does it serve a social function, um, does, it, is, does it even have an evolutionary benefit? And uh, th- that interests me as, as an academic. Uh, to me, though, it's a huge step 
to go from even saying it's a good thing, even saying that, that I, I wish there were more Christianity in the world, even from, for, for, to say that is, is nothing to do with believing it. It's truth claims. I mean, truth claims like there is a divine creator who made the universe and, and made the laws of physics. There's a divine um, creator who, who made the world, who, who listens to our prayers, who, who forgives our sins, um, who sent Jesus to be born of a virgin and then, and then had him crucified. I mean, those are all truth claims. Of course, none of that matters as long as it helps us fight Putin. As far as well, as that that's the difference between me and uh, and Ayan. I I suspect that, that that she doesn't really believe any of that. And presumably, uh, many Christians, and I've seen many Christians reacting to this uh, story of Ayan's conversion, issuing a similar skepticism as many atheists have been, saying, "Well, we care about Christianity as a set of truth claims. We care about it saying something real about the world. If somebody can become a Christian just by." preferring it as a as a as a more comfortable worldview what does that say about christianity i mean i said a moment ago that well for us religion just is a, a social tool essentially and i think that the ability to adopt christianity just because of its social function is evidence in favor of our case that that's all religion is yeah i think we agree about that i think where we perhaps don't agree we no i wouldn't say we disagree i would say um, that our fundamental motivation is a bit different because I think that for you, well, if I ask you what you think the the worst thing about Christianity is, I suspect you say something something moral, something about um, the problem of evil, something about the uh, the the horrific ideas of the of Paul and and the early Christian fathers um, that, that 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 we're all born in sin and and and. The, the, we needed the death of Jesus to save us. That's the kind of thing that I suspect drives your atheism. Whereas for me, I, that's irrelevant. I mean, for me, I, I talk about it, but for me, what really drives it is the scientific question is, is there a creator underneath the universe? Because if there is, then it's a profoundly different kind of universe from a scientific point of view, From if there isn't. To me, that's the big question. The, Problem of evil to me wouldn't shouldn't be a real problem because you just say well there could be an evil god and, and um, that that so that that that's a lesser question for me. Yes, uh, I think I actually do broadly agree with you, and that when when I explain why I don't believe in God, I do make reference to things like the problem of evil. But it's difficult for me to frame those as moralistic objections. It, it's more that when considering a particular worldview like Christianity, I think what would I expect the world to look like? And especially considering how suffering is built into the evolutionary system, it makes it very difficult for me to believe that this is being supervised. But like you say, this could just be an evil God. I'm really interested in your characterization of the existence of God and the beginning of the universe as a scientific question. And I wanted to probe this a little bit. Yes, because please. I, I had a I had a thought that was inspired by something that C.S. Lewis had said on the relationship between science and religion. And I have this image in my head of uh, people who are, who are really optimistic about the progress of science and the scientific method. And they say something like, look, you know, years ago, we used to say so much was down to God. We used to not know why the, why the planets orbited the sun. And we said it was because angels was pushing them. We used to not know why there was so much complexity in biological life. And we said that God did it. But look how we're discovering these laws. We're discovering the law of natural selection. We're discovering the laws of gravity, you know. And there seems to be this trajectory such that when we say, well, where did it all come from in the first place? One day we'll get there. Now, I don't know if you agree with that as, a, as an optimistic trajectory for, for the scientific method. Clearly there's a trajectory. And uh, I, I, I would put it that uh, the big problem of design as William Paley put it, was life. He said something like the physical world is not the best place in which to, to um, demonstrate the existence of the, of, the, of the creator because it's too simple. Hmm. And I think he was right. And um, he, he was also right when he said that the, the really big problem for religion is, is, is life. And yes. his, both his, his whole book is based upon looking at design in the, in the living world. Darwin solved that. So Darwin solved the big one. 
And um, we have some re remaining problems. The the arc is still hasn't really reached its end. We still have some problems with the origin of the laws of physics, the origin of the universe. But I think that the fact that Darwin solved the big one should gives us give us confidence. Uh, the, that was the really difficult one. The 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 amazing apparent design in the living world. I mean, that is such an such an a staggeringly overwhelming impression of, of design. There's no question about that. And that was the one that Darwin solved. Well, Darwin solves the problem of complexity within living organisms. But I think it might be a step too far to say he solved the problem of life. Because, of course, one of the questions that we have to throw into that bundle of things yet to explain, the origin of the the origin physics, of, yes. the origin of life. The origin and of life. Well, that's not part of Darwinism, of course. That, right. That's a separate question, and Darwin acknowledged that. And that, that is an unsolved problem. It may never be solved in the sense that we may never actually know what the answer is. I think the best we can probably hope for is a model which is so elegant mm. that we may say, well, that's, that's so elegant, it's got to be true. I mean, it, it would, but that's very, a bit different from having direct, direct evidence. At present, we don't really have that. Um, we have various possible ideas, some of them more plausible than others. And I think we know the kind of question we're trying to answer. We're trying to answer how did the first self-replicating entity come into existence? And that's a big yes. question. It only had to happen once, um, unlike, the, unlike the rest of evolution, which where it happened over and over and over again. The same thing happened over and over again, all over the world, different continents, different species, different kinds of animal and plant and so on. Um, the origin of life could have been a very, very improbable event because it only had to happen once. Uh, and therefore we are potentially allowed to postulate something very unlikely, something very implausible. I find that quite an interesting point, actually, that, that, um, yes. that, that I mean, if you take it to an extreme, so suppose we are the only planet in the universe which has life, which is, we can't rule that out. I think it's highly unlikely, but we can't rule it out. If that's true, then that means that the origin of life on this planet was a, a, a stupendously improbable event. Mm. And therefore, when chemists try to postulate a possible scenario for the origin of life, they're not looking for a plausible argument. They're looking for a very implausible <laughs> argument. That's fascinating, yeah. Now, I don't believe that because I think that probably it was a, a, not that improbable an, an sure. event. And therefore, and therefore, the likelihood is that there's lots of life all over the universe. Uh, but um, even to say, let's say, a, a, a million different life forms all over the universe, since the number of possible places where there could be life is so large. Yes. A million is actually a very small number. That's fascinating. I mean, there are, there are many things in the universe that, that have a tiny, tiny chance of happening, but could. Like, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've heard physicists say that because atoms are just vibrating and, and they're all sort of vibrating against each other and hence we get stillness. There's a, there's a very small, uh, unimaginably small possibility, but a real one that this this glass could just sort of spontaneously move across the yes, table right, if all yes, of the atoms, yes. you know, happen to vibrate yep. in that direction. Yes. Now, the universe, like you say, I mean, everybody talks about the universe being vast. I read, I think, this morning that if the sun were the size of a white blood cell, then the Milky Way would be the size of the continental United States. Yeah, now, you, terrifying. We, we might need to fact check yes. that exact example, yes. but it's on, and that's just the Milky Way. And yes. when you consider that, uh, okay, oh, are you saying that, you know, in, in a materialistic universe, life can just sort of pop into existence? Well, I understand the suspicion that that might be something unimaginably uh, unlikely, but we're in an unimaginable universe. Yes, so that's, yes. a, that's a wonderful way of thinking. Yes, I, I wouldn't want to resort to that. Right, I think yeah. we, don't, we don't need to. Um, by the way, the, the possibility of the glass moving across the table, it's there. But I once asked a physicist what the, likely, what the probability is, and he said if you started writing zeros at the, at the origin of the universe, you'd still be writing zeros at this... Um, right. So... Um, we probably don't have to go that far yes. in, in, in our, we could have a sort of spectrum of improbabilities. And, and I can already see, uh, you know, a, a, a theist cutting this up and saying yeah. atheists admit that exactly. their, that their exactly. worldview so we don't, we don't want to is unimaginably there. unlikely. We don't, we don't want to go there. I mean, my, 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 my gut feelings, uh, Carl Sagan said, well, I try not to think with my gut, but if, if I'm forced, <laughs> my, my gut feeling would be that there, there, are, there is lots of life around the universe, but still it could be so rare that 
um, we don't uh, have much chance of ever meeting any of these other life sure. forms. Sure. Um, uh, that's fascinating. But let's push the, the question even further back still, because I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned about the, the origin of the laws of physics, for example. Yes. Now, the story that we tell is something like we discover all of these laws and so this gives us an idea that science is moving in a direction and that eventually we, we, we may well discover the origin of the laws themselves. But th that seems to me like a separate question. And the way I want to explain this is by sort of borrowing and adapting, uh, as I say, something C.S. Lewis said. Um, Lewis talks about the relationship between Hamlet and Shakespeare a fair bit, or the character in a book and, and his author. I mean, I, I can ask, you know, why did... Uh, why did Sherlock Holmes move into Baker Street? And you can either say, well, it's because, uh, you know, he, he was looking for a roommate or, or something like that. Or you could say, because Arthur Conan Doyle wanted him to. And both of those seem to be true in a different resolution of thought. Now, what I'm imagining here is us discovering Hamlet by Shakespeare on the table in front of us. And immediately, crudely, you look at it and say, well, that must have been designed. You know, that must have an author. And... I don't just do the William Paley thing, you know, it's complex. What I say is, well, look, Professor Dawkins, I, I've, I've done some research onto this little book and I've discovered that it obeys certain laws. You know, I, I've noticed that at the end of certain sentences, there are these little dots. And if there's a big dot, it, used, it usually means that it's the end of a sentence. And there are two different kinds of each letter. It's a big A and a little A. And if it's the beginning of a sentence, it's a new one. Also, we've discovered this thing called iambic pentameter. You know, it, it seems that the way these sentences are constructed seem to follow this law, this law of literacy. And I said to you, now, where did this book come from? And you say, I still think there was an author of this book. I still think someone created it. And I said, yeah, but look at all the progress that we've made just by describing it in terms of these things that we're calling laws of literature. I've discovered all of these laws of literature, iambic pentameter and sentence construction and grammar and all of this stuff. Surely one day these laws of literacy will, will go on to explain the origin of the laws of the literacy or, or the origin of the text itself. Surely that would... Surely that would be where this is going. But of course, I'm making a, a category error if I do that. And is there not a, a fear that we're doing that when we say that science will one day explain the origin of the very thing that science is about? I take confidence from, the, from, as I said before, from Darwin's success, because everything that you said about full stops and capital letters at the beginning of the, of the sentence, and I like pentameters and things, you could have said that about life, and people did say that about life. And it, we, we notice that living things are remarkably well designed, that birds are beautifully designed to fly and, and fish are beautifully designed to, to swim and, and so on. Um, and the complexity is all there, the, the detail of the... Of, of of the design is is incredibly impressive, and it would have seemed absolutely. I mean, I suspect this is why it took so long for Darwin to come on the scene, actually, because it just seemed so obvious that it had to, it had to be, uh, had an author, sure, uh, but but behind it, Darwin solved that. There isn't an author. I mean, it's it's natural selection does the trick. So. Where is the where is the analogy with Hamlet or Sherlock Holmes I left? I suppose then? the analogy would be that um, what Darwin did was was close the question on the complexity of life, but he didn't close the question on where life came from, as we've already no, that's agreed. Right. And, and, but, and I, I suppose what I'm putting forward is that maybe laws of physics, laws of biology, laws of science are not the kind of thing that can explain the origin of the laws of physics, the origin of the laws of biology, that kind of stuff, where maybe it's sort of uh, operating on a, on a... Well, it could be. I mean, we, we haven't got there yet, but, but what, all, all, all I said was that, that Darwin's success should give us confidence mm. um, and, and that there will come a time when we understand the laws of physics. I think we're not far off. I'm not we. I mean, the physicists aren't far off that now, in, in fact. Mm. Now, we, uh, we, we were talking about Ian Hirst Ali and... and it's an interesting detour, but I did want to ask you about this vision of, of religion uh, for two reasons. This, this idea that religion, uh, we don't really care about the question of whether it's true that Jesus was born of a virgin or whether he actually died on a cross. In fact, maybe I'm just going to refuse to answer it altogether and say that this is a, is a cultural thing. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a, it's a motivating reason behind your behaviors. I think that this has got a lot to do with uh, its popularization through people like Jordan Peterson. Ian Hirsi Ali seems to have been spending some time with Jordan Peterson and, and, and getting on with him, uh, at least in this regard. And I want to ask you about it for two reasons. Firstly, I want to know, I mean, you had a conversation with Jordan Peterson uh, it was for about an hour and a half where you, you talked about, um, well, you talked about some culture stuff 
but he's very well known at the moment. He's writing a book at the moment for talking about religion. And he comes at it from this completely different perspective to, I imagine, the perspective that most of your previous Christian opponents, not that Jordan Peterson is strictly a Christian, have come at it from. And I wonder what you make of him and his approach. I enormously respect his courage in standing up to the Canadian laws about free speech. So I want to just get that out of the way first. I hugely respect that and and, and value him for that reason. Um, he, when he talks about religion, I think it's bullshit. I think I think that he's, he doesn't make any sense at all. I think I think he's he's impressing people by using language they don't understand, rather like Deepak Chopra, um, where where people think, oh, it must be terribly profound because I can't understand it, <laughs> um, which is which is um, not something I, I can respect. Um, Michael Shermer told me that. Um, he tried to pin him down and said, do, do you actually believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? And Jordan Peterson said, it would take me at least two days to answer that. So Michael said, more or less, well, how about one sentence or one word? No. Um, and that's how I feel about, about that. Um, all the stuff about Jungian archetypes, and not that I, I would be skeptical about that, but, but, but constantly dragging them in. I mean... Um, I think the most egregious example of that is where he t he looks at works of primitive art, works of tri tribal art, where he shows things like two s snakes coiling around each other and says, well, they must have had some primitive, um, primeval knowledge of DNA. Perhaps they looked into their own cells and, in some sense and saw the DNA. Perhaps the DNA is the double helix is a Jungian archetype. And that is sheer bullshit. And I told him so. <laughs> do you think that you can have a productive conversation with him about religion if this is the approach he's taking? Do you think there's any room for progress here talking to someone like Peterson? Well, I hesitate to say no to, to, about, about that to anybody. But 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 I, I have, so far, I'm not given any confidence. And I, and I want to once again say how much I respect his, his courage in standing up to the... The, the woke nonsense. Yes, we sandwich the the bullshit in between the yeah. in between the respect. Um, Peterson's approach here has, seems to have unlocked a new interest in particularly the Bible and, uh, as he calls it, the biblical corpus. Um, my my friend Chris Williamson asked him recently on a podcast because he kept talking about the biblical corpus. He said, "When you say the biblical corpus, do you mean the Bible?" He says, "Yes," and I'm thinking, "Well, you know." Why not just call it the Bible then? But he he has a, a inspired this this renewed interest in in the biblical corpus, um, because of that. Because now, when you see people debating religion, it, it tends to be less "Does God exist?" and more about the utility of religion and the you know, Jungian archetypes and stuff. The God Delusion, which was the atheist book, do you think it still survives as a sufficient treatment of God and religion? in modern culture, if you were to write it again, would you be taking the same approach of talking about it as a scientific issue, or would you feel the need to, to change the way that you're talking I, about the I, I would altogether? certainly still talk about it as a scientific issue, because I think that's, that's the most important thing. I probably might add a chapter on uh, the idea of uh, well, what Dan Dennett calls belief in belief, um, where, where the, the idea that, that, that whether you believe it or not, it's a good idea that some people do. And, and and I think that's patronizing. I think that's condescending. It's, it's sort of saying, well, we intellectuals don't need don't need this crutch, but other people may do. And if they do, then it's a good thing because it helps in the battle against Putin. Well, not that Putin himself is really. I, I think Voltaire said, uh, "I don't believe in God, but I hope that my maid does." Well, that's an, I didn't know that quote. It's a very good example, um, and that, that is so patronizing. Yes, and indeed it also, you know when you're debating the moral argument with people, when they say without God there could be no morality, and sometimes an atheist says, well, how dare you say that I can't be moral without God? And they say, I'm not saying you can't be moral without God, I'm just saying you can't ground your morality. Yeah. And yet, on the other hand, they say, but we need you to believe in God, otherwise society falls apart. 
maybe you are actually saying that people can't be moral without God, more than just their ability to ground it, if you're saying that without this religious belief, society will fall apart. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I'm, I'm, I rec recognize that some people may think that. I mean, I, th I think that to ground your morality in, certainly in the Bible, would be an appalling thing to do. If you actually look at the Bible, if you look at, look at any of the moral almost any of the moral lessons you can take from it. And some of the things Jesus said are very nice, but, but you have to pick and choose your way through. And, and, and um, setting aside Jesus's um, emphasis on loving your neighbor, which is very nice. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is, is very nice. The, the fundamental doctrine of, uh, well, the Old Testament, of course, is appalling, but even- Yeah, putting the Old Testament aside. Yeah, putting in the that New aside, Testament. even the New Testament, um, the, the idea, that we're born in sin is a hideous idea. The idea that, that the only way to be saved from sin and the wages of sin is, is Jesus' death um, is a hideous idea. And it's, I don't think it's one that Jesus himself ever put forward, is it? I, I, I think he probably would, would, would be rather shocked at that, at that thought. Well, I imagine that Jesus would have to be aware of himself as the salvation and if that's the case, he'll need to be aware of what he's saving people from, which can only be something like slavery to sin. Now, I wonder whether you're re reading something in there. I mean, salvation, um, I mean, he said things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But but did, did he actually say that he was salvation? Well, I suppose I am the way, the truth, and the oh, life. Yeah, but that, no that one comes into the I, Father I except am, through I me. Am, a guide for a good, a good life, something like that. It doesn't mean that, that he surely never said that my death is necessary in order for you to be saved from sin. Quite possibly. Um, I mean, I think about the, the idea of the Eucharist and the Last Supper and, and literally uh, breaking up you know, my body for you. It, it does seem to be uh, some indication that Jesus knew what he was doing if the, if the Christians are correct about his mission on earth. A moment ago, you said it's an appalling idea that we're all born in sin. And I understand this intuition, but do you not think there's some wisdom in this idea or, or some sort of necessary humility in, in recognizing that you know, we all do seem to fall short of the standards that we set for ourselves? That is, we're not going to make sense of a concept like sin because we don't believe in God. You know, we're, we're atheists. Sin doesn't make sense. But even just in terms of our own moral standards, whatever standards we set for ourselves, we seem to fall short of these every single day. And is it not just that idea that's being captured when somebody says, look, even even by your own standards, you're you're falling short of where you should be? And maybe that's what... Even a newborn baby? We should born take it to in sin? Well... I would probably respond by saying that not all Christians will say that a newborn baby is born in sin in the sense that they're responsible for it, more like born with a propensity towards sinning, which I imagine you would even agree with, that, that newborn babies, although they haven't you know, committed immoral acts yet, they're born with this sort of human nature which has a, a predisposition towards doing things that fall short of our moral standards, maybe. I'm sorry for you having to do a degree in this kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, it's not a real subject, is it? It's, we, you know, we talked about this before um, on on our previous podcast, and yeah. and I, I think it's something that you wanted to ask ask me about today, isn't it? I mean, we well, yes, I, I, um, it's obviously something that still interests you. Mm, oh, um, certainly, talking yeah. about you know sin and things like that. Um, I I cannot imagine spending three years. How did you stand it? I'll answer it in two ways. The first is to say that the theology faculty was actually theology and religion. So I was able to study religion as anthropology, religion as history. You know, you can do papers in okay, that science would be and religion, this, this kind yeah. of thing. And I imagine you would be, yeah. you'd be very interested in that kind yes. of thing. Theology itself I found useful for a, for a few reasons. One of them, uh, and it, you know, uh, of course there's like a crude sense in which by studying theology it helps me to debate it, it helps me to argue with people. Uh, but, I get that, definitely. But it's it's also an interesting window into human psychology. For example, you know, clearly the the question does interest you. Why is it that people can 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 believe so strongly and so easily in this idea that everybody's born in sin? Yes, isn't, that isn't is that interesting. Evil? But, isn't but that horrible? It, it, that's a psychological question. If if you, I don't know what sort of essays you had to write, but if you were allowed to write an essay on that. That would have been interesting if you were allowed to ask a question 
uh, how can anyone believe this stuff? Hmm. Um, but I imagine you had to actually write a serious essay on the concept of sin itself and the idea of redemption and the idea of atonement. Well, suppose you wanted to, to write that, that essay, which, which you just said was an interesting question. Why would anybody believe this? Well, in order to answer that, you, you have to get to grips with the reasons people have for yes. believing it. You yes. Know? And I suppose that's what I'm do doing here with you in saying, when because when, you bring up the point when you look at the New Testament, you, you bring up this, this uh, exegesis, this interpretation. This is an evil text because it tells people that they're born in sin. And I suppose the question implicitly in what you're saying there is, how can you believe this? And I'm doing that devil's advocate thing again of, of trying to, I suppose, explain why it is that somebody might believe this and say that even an atheist might recognize that there's a sense in which that's at least poetically true. We're all born in a state where we are unable to fulfill the standard that we want yes. to fulfill. You know what yes. I mean? Um, poetically, uh, yes, I suppose it. I suppose you could see it at a, at a poetic level. Um, it, interestingly, I don't know whether I've told you this before, but, but um, when The Selfish Gene was published, both the chaplains of my college came up to me and said they, they'd read it and they, they thought it had echoes of original sin. Hmm. Um, and it was a poetic, it was a poetic resonance with, with original sin. Um, hmm. And I suppose, I mean, that's quite interesting. Why, why would the selfish gene have a, a resonance with original oh, sin? Um, well, uh, they, they were thinking of it in terms of the, uh, the selfish gene um, uh, having um, a sort of primitive rationale for selfishness. So that's not what the book was really intended to be about, but that's how they interpreted yes. it. And so that, 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 that resonated with their idea of original sin. And what do you make of the criticism in the opposite direction? Somebody says, you know, I've spent my life uh, studying Thomistic metaphysics. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a classical theologian. I've got a PhD and I looked in the God Delusion and I wanted to see what Richard Dawkins had to say about Thomas Aquinas's five proofs for the existence, his five ways to, for, to establish the existence of God. And they find two pages. And this, this sort of pinnacle of religious philosophy as they see it has a treatment in two pages. Yes. And, and when, when they question you and say, well, what about all of the, the important theological nuances, you respond to them, well, why would I do theology? Theology is uninteresting. I think I would say to that, why privilege Christian theology when there are thousands of gods all around the world? They all have their own theology. And these uh, Thomist theologians are equally ignorant of Aboriginal uh, theology and and Bantu theology and, and Papua New Guinea theology. That's true. Um, and th they think that their theology is somehow high flown and intellectually important, but it has no greater status than any of those. The thing about science is that it's universal. Mm. It, 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 it is not local, it's not, it's not tied to any particular tribe or group of people or, or um, time in history. It's what you discover in science is universal and timeless. I think that's fair enough. But then I also think that if one of these Thomistic metaphysicians wrote a book called the Aborigine delusion, or or they they try to sort of write a chapter where they said I'm I'm going to debunk this idea, and then they spent two pages on it. The delusion that I'm interested in is the very existence of a supernatural creator. It's right. not particularly Chris Christianity. In, in so far as I talked about Christianity, that's because I I'm brought up in in, in a in a Christian culture. Mm. Um, but what really interests me is the existence of a divine creator at all. Mm. And I suppose you're allowed to say that in a different way, in a, where you say, well, I'm talking about Christianity because I was brought up in that culture. And people will say, fair enough, that's what you chose to write in. Whereas a Christian, if they say, well, I, I focus on Christianity because I was brought up in a Christian culture, that seems to slightly well, undermine their yes. position. I mean, but it, but if if they use that as as a reason for why they believe, that's and, a very different thing than by using it as a reason why I chose to t talk about it as an example. Quite right. <laughs> do you still do debates? Well, I don't like the sort of debate format where you have ten minutes for the proposition, ten minutes for the opposition, and things like that. Because I, d I don't think that's the way we decide things. Um, I mean, the, the debate I attended at the Oxford Union a few weeks ago that you were in. Mm. 
um, I think your side lost. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the they don't make that bit obvious on the YouTube video, but I suppose everybody knows now. Yes, yeah, and, we lost. And, and, and it, it's in a way, I'm sure it was for, for all the wrong reasons. And, <laughs> and, and um, well, um, I, I, I read recently an account of the famous, this house will not vote for king and country debate in the 1930s in, in Oxford. And mm. um, that caused a great scandal because of, the, because of the way the debate went at the time. And it seems to be, what I gather from the history is that the reason the, the debate was carried was the amusing wit and eloquence of one of the speakers. And, mm. and that's, not the way, that's not the way you win arguments by wit and eloquence. Yeah. It, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. Do you attribute some of the success of the New Atheist movement, which I, anybody would struggle to say that the New Atheists were not sort of going on these marathons of, of winning debates. How much of that do you think just had to do with the fact that you had Christopher Hitchens in your arsenal who could recite some poetry on stage and make people laugh? Uh, I, I asked for that, I suppose, right when I mentioned the CM Joad um, thing. Um, well, he was, of course, superbly witty and um, erudite and could pull a quotation whenever he needed it. And, and um, I would like to think that such a, such a success as we had um, was due to having good arguments rather than to the eloquence of, of any one particular individual. I'd, 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 I'd be sorry if... if People change their minds on, on the basis of, the, well, so we say the wrong, the wrong reasons. Not, not, not really taking the argument seriously, but, but, um, but the, because one of the speakers gave them a good laugh or, or, mm. or something. I mean, you, you, you do quite like doing debates. Uh, sometimes, yes. It, it kind of, it depends. I, I, my, my understanding of debates is that a lot of the time they are just theatre, and I think that as long as you recognise that's what you're doing, there, there's no strict problem with with doing that it's a good way to get people to get excited about a subject it's a good way to introduce them to some of the arguments that they might want to go and study at home but the idea that it's a a place for exhaustive you know presentation of a worldview while you're doing it in front of a person whose entire job is to make you essentially or at least your arguments look bad and look flawed yeah. and an audience with a proneness to to you know, fidgeting and getting bored and preferring to yes. be a bit entertained or to laugh, you know, that's the arena that you're walking into. That's something, in other words, that I've learned about doing debates. As as I've, I've done them in the past, I've gone in thinking, oh, I'm not even going to really research the person that I'm about to debate because I want to sort of you know really engage on the spot. And I, I had this idea that I'm going in with a with a with a real desire to get to the truth. Whereas as time goes on, you begin to realise that actually it's something of a performance in many ways. Yes. Um, I think the Oxford Union has especially descended into a time when there's a lot, what well, wasn't quite so bad at the debate that you were in a few weeks ago, but I've seen it in the past where people are constantly popping up with so-called points of information. Yes. Or points of order. They, they are never either points of information or very, very seldom points of information. They're points of opinion. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think... Um, it's probably right. The points of information is right. On, on a point of information, Mr. President, uh, the speaker's got his figures wrong. The number of people, yes, you know, killed in the Holocaust was so and so and so and so, rather than what he said. That's yeah. a point of information. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, people might not be aware in these in these formal debates. You, it, it's in the rule book. You're allowed to interrupt a speaker if you're ever watching a. a debate speech at the Oxford Union and someone from the audience just sort of stands up and starts talking it's because you're allowed to do that and you say point of information and as you say the idea is that it's supposed to be exactly that a point of information yes. but somebody ends up just sort of giving a mini speech themselves yes well it. the the president no doubt when it was first started the president would have would have been on on, on onto that but but the, the custom has grown up the points of information are just ways of interrupting somebody's speech yes with, and, with your own speech and now that you know, you can get away with it. Like that's that's what people do. And why not do that if everybody's just getting away with it? Yes, yes. I, I think I, I POI'd the uh, the cardinal at one point because he was talking about Cardinal Turkson, um, a man who I'm told is in the running to become the next pope. Yes, uh, was giving a speech and and was talking about the Vatican's contribution to science and how yes. they set up the first scientific academy with yeah, members yeah. including Galileo. Yes, and my point of information was to simply ask. 
what then happened to that yes, Galileo? Yes, 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 yes. And it was funny because it seemed like he didn't understand that I was trying to sort of make a point because yes. he just answered it just just completely flatly. Just said, yes. "Oh well, he was um, he was not a member anymore afterwards, and then he became a member again." Just answered it very straight up, and then yes. uh, I feel like the point might have been lost. But that's yes. what a point of information is supposed to be for. Yes, quite yeah, right. And these yes, debates, yes. they they yeah they, they they leave too much room for for rhetoric. They leave too much room for um. You're so aware that you're on display that, that I yes. don't know, it, it, it's not very conducive to yes. open conversation of the kind that we're having now. I, I used to attend the union every week when I was an undergraduate and really? and, and I, I enjoyed it very much. I must say, I enjoyed the rhetoric and, and, and I enjoyed the sort of things that I'm not, not, not so keen on. Um, and I, I, I suppose I am actually a life member, but I'm not, I think I've lost my card. I'm not sure they let me in. I'm sure they'll, they'll let you in. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I wonder, uh, if you were invited, I mean, there are, there are some wonderful classic debates that you've done with people like John Lennox. Um, oh, I, I wonder if you were invited to do something like that today. Is it something you'd still be interested in doing? I'm talking about the, the formal debate, audience, 10 minute opening statement, cross-examination, does God exist? Yeah, no, I, well, I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, um, I, I would like to have a discussion with, uh, as I have with the Archbishop of Canterbury, for example, um, and uh, I, I find, the, I've had actually, I think, two or three discussions with him, and they've been very civilized and uh, enjoyable, and I think an, an honest attempt at dialogue. Um, I don't think I'd like to do it in the debate format. Um, I, I did agree to do a debate in the Cambridge Union in which the Arch, the, uh, Rowan Williams was one of the speakers. And um, uh, that that was sort of not too bad. Um, but but no, I, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be falling over myself to have a debate on that subject. Who's the most formidable debate opponent that you have had in your career that you can think of now uh, on this question of God's existence? I don't think there are any. <laughs> um, not, not that not that I'm formidable myself, but 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 I I, I don't think that there are any very good arguments. Um, no point in a debate where where you're sat there getting ready to get up and give your ten minute rebuttal while they're speaking, writing your notes, and thinking. Oh gosh, uh, what am I going to say to that? that? That's that's a that's a fair point. I don't think so. Um, I, mean, I don't want to sound arrogant. It's not that I've got great great points. It's just that I don't think there are any good points to be made. You know, maybe it's something about the debate format as well. You know, everybody's so prepared that you know, yes. you're rarely caught off guard. Yes. Um, I mean, the sort of professional debaters on, on behalf of religion, uh, people like William Craig, um, I've, I've no time for him. I mean, he's, he, he, he's got this sort of loud, uh, rather pompous voice and, and, and um, he says that's a premise one, deduction two, and things like that. And, and the audience, <laughs> I suppose, is supposed to be impressed. I, <laughs> I've had, I've had, uh, William Lane Craig twice on on my podcast, and I always had a good experience with him. Having said that, I didn't debate him. I don't know what that would be like. It, it, something you're not interested in doing, debating William Lane Craig, or, or having well, a have conversation done. perhaps with William Lane Craig. I, I have done. Um, I I vowed not to. I, I I I feel such contempt for him because of his. I don't know whether you've seen his what he says, says about the something about Israelites slaughtering the Midianites and and and. Instead of saying what any decent theologian would say, well, it never happened, um, uh, and it was, this is just an you know, Old Testament story, um, he says, um, well, the Midianites had it coming uh, because they were so sinful. And then um, uh, if you worry about the Midianite children who had their brains beaten out of them, um, well, that's okay because they went straight to heaven. And, and that, that finished him, him off as far as I was concerned. Now, um, for me, I actually wrote a, a piece in the in the Guardian saying why I will I will never have anything to do with him. I can see why you you might sort of look at something like that and say that's a, that's an evil thing to think. That's an evil thing to say. I don't want to debate this person. 
a, a few moments ago, you told me that the idea of the New Testament in general about you know being born yes. in sin and needing yeah. salvation is an evil idea. Yes. And yet, that's an idea that many of the opponents that you have spoken to will have believed. They, they believe yes. evil things too. So, so why particularly yes, with William a, Lane Craig? It's, do you it's have a fair point. Um, I, I think the, the thing is that um, the Christian theologians who, who take this seriously um, is are honestly well-meaning. I mean, they 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 believe in the God of love. They believe they believe in Jesus as the as the as the Son of God of love, and so on. Um, I think the the sheer well, they 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 would never have defended the slaughter of the Midianites and the Jebusites and things in the Book of Joshua. Um, as somehow justified because because the Midianites were, were sinful. Um, um, it is, I think there's an order of magnitude worse there. Perhaps you would disagree with that. But. Maybe. I mean, I think there's a sense in which a, a Christian who believes in the historicity of the Old Testament, I mean, the Midianites might be, it's, it's, I'm sometimes told it's complicated by the fact that it's Moses who instructs the slaughter of the Midianites, but it seems clear to me that this is sanctioned by God. I think that a, a a Christian who believes in the history of the Old Testament just has to believe that whatever happened there was somehow okay with God, was somehow moral. Now, I agree that that, that, that to me is a criticism I make all the time. How could this be moral? But I also say, how could it be moral that God allows children to get cancer? How could it be moral that, you know, yes. God, and, and, and I suppose the thing that I would say is that if, if you pressed a Christian, well, if there's a good God, why do children get cancer? They just have to say something like, there must be some reason for this. There must be some explanation. Yes, I suppose that if if they really do have to, be, if they really do believe the literal word of the Bible, but mm. then that that brings us back to fundamentalist creationists. I mean, well, uh, even just just in terms of why God would allow evil at all. Uh, what I'm what I'm imagining, in other words, is suppose we had this other Christian philosopher debater, and. Uh, Somebody had said to them, well, why do children get cancer if there's a good God? And they said, look, if I believe in a good God, I have to believe that the, the children who die of cancer are going to heaven. I have to believe that there's some reason for the suffering that they're undergoing. Yes. Now, you could say, this person said that you know, kids who have cancer, oh, they should be grateful because they're going straight to heaven. And are oh, there some reason to give children cancer? That's despicable. I want nothing to do with this person. I'll never debate them. However, I would suppose that basically everybody that you've debated on the topic of Christianity would say something yeah. like that about yes, they probably children. Would. And so I wonder yes, why with you, William Lane you, Craig it's yes, a particular you, problem. You, you, you make a good point. I suppose um, no, none of these sophisticated theologians take the literal word of the Old Testament seriously. I mean, they don't, they don't believe in Adam and Eve, for example. Um, they, don't, they don't believe in um, the, the... Therefore, why, why would you believe... That the the story of the Midianites hmm. is 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 history. Why not just sort of say, well, this is some kind of tribal myth, and, and all sorts of tribes have these horrible. Well, I can keep up this um, God's advocate, if you like. I, I would say, in other words, I would answer that question with a Christian hat on by saying that the Bible is a collection of books rather than a book, yep. and that that book contains different genres, and that the genre exactly. of, of Genesis is something like yes. poetry. Exactly, the genre of numbers seems much more to be at least intended to be history in a way that the the genre of paul is is letters it's epistles yes. whether or not you think he actually even existed you know i mean i think paul existed just to be clear but yeah you know, it doesn't really matter it's still clear that what the if you think that it's true the kind of thing that paul's doing is writing letters the kind of thing that acts is doing is essentially you know biography or history is attempting to do that it seems to me that where numbers is very obviously trying to just recount historical events Genesis seems a lot more allegorical to me. And so it doesn't seem inconsistent for me to say, well, of course, I don't believe in Adam and Eve. I don't believe in the seven day creation. But I do believe that there was a real slaughter of the Midianites by Moses and his armies. Well, yes. And, 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 and then, um, I mean, you, I don't think you should then go ahead to justify it, but by Quite right, that, yeah. that they were sinful. I mean, I, I should have thought that the, 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 the right and proper thing for a Christian to say is uh, the, the slaughter of the Midianites is no more factual history than the story of Jupiter or Apollo um, 
I mean, Thor with with his hammer and things. These these are these are tribal myths, um, which um, uh, which we could study as 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 mythology. But why why go out of your way to make it sound much more evil than it really is? Um, by saying, well, the Midianites were sinful and their children were going to heaven. Anyway, it's somehow, I, I just find it more appalling. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I, I find it sort of appalling that you, that you take it so seriously, that you, that you actually, well, you take the belief in, those, in the historicity of it so seriously, that you even defend it, rather than just say, as a, any decent bishop would say, would say, well, it's never happened. And, I think that um, as particularly at the height of the the new atheism and and religion debates that were happening in in the in the sort of late two thousands, I think a lot of people were disappointed that the forerunner of the atheist side, Richard Dawkins, and arguably the forerunner of the Christian side, William Lane Craig, never came together to have that debate because even if you do think that what he believes there is particularly and and, and specifically evil. I suppose everything you've just said to me, people would probably just like to see you say that to William Lane Craig. I wrote an article in The Guardian saying it, um, and um, I did in fact have a debate with him in Mexico, I forget mm. when. Um, with, uh, with the boxing ring? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, I just no and desire enough. to, to um, yeah. I, I don't respect him. I, 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 I find his manner pompous and, and I, I just don't don't want to be in the same room as him, really. Well, in, in the interest of diplomacy, I will offer no further comment, except that that's, that's certainly not my experience with the man. But um, okay, I, I, I imagine that we've, uh, we've had very different uh, interactions with him in the mm. past, let's mm. put it that way. Well, on this topic of debates and arguments for God's existence anyway, I, I, the, I suppose what I wanted to do was ask you about two arguments that I've been thinking about uh, related to God's existence, but specifically related to evolution and naturalism as well. Right. Because I, I think that these are... Uh, questions which I, I'm sure you've commented on before somewhere, but um, I'd, I'd, I guess I'd like to probe again. Yeah. Um, one of these is Lewis's argument from desire, which sounds like a very silly argument on the face of it. He essentially says something along the lines of, look, everybody seems to have an innate desire for something a bit beyond the natural, something a bit supernatural, something, you know, beauty, purpose, this kind of intangible stuff. And he says, I, I actually wrote down the, the way he puts it in Mere Christianity. He says, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to them, to, that offer to give it to you, but never quite keep their promise. And then later... If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And like I say, on the face of it, that sounds maybe a little bit silly. But there is a serious question in here that most of the time when we evolve a desire for something, you know, we evolve a desire for food, for warmth, this kind of thing. The reason for that is because this desire uh, gives us reason to seek out those things in the real world. If there were no food and digestion, if there were no temperature, it would make no sense for us to, des to, to evolve a desire for food, for temperature, for, for, for warmth. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. Why would that even evolve in the first place if it doesn't actually latch on to anything in the real world? And although I'm not sure if Lewis was aware of this, we, we know anthropologically that almost everywhere we look in the world, we find people with religious sensibilities. They have some kind of either desire or... Uh, apprehension of something beyond themselves, something divine. And I suppose the question Lewis asks is, from an evolutionary perspective, why would it be that we would universally evolve that desire if that desire doesn't actually latch onto anything in, in reality? <sighs> I find it a very odd argument. Um, because we have uh, a desire to survive and live, which makes perfect, e perfect evolutionary sense, it's a natural projection of that desire that we might desire to go on living after we die. We a desire for eternal life. You know, um, you, you could you could easily see that as just as just an extension of the um, of the perfectly um, Darwinian desire to to go on to go on living to go on living. 
Um, I think it's just another example of that. Uh, um, th that particular part of it is, I suppose. Um, what else did he say? The 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 desire for something beyond. Um, he says, "Want acutely is something that cannot be had in this world." Um, I mean, he says he says a lot more uh, about it in mere Christianity. But he says, "If there's if I find it myself in a, a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world." Yes, I mean, the idea that because you want something, therefore it must be true. I find that a most extraordinary idea. It, it, it does seem strange to want something that doesn't exist. Why? Because. If we're trying to give an account of where this desire comes from, it seems to have to latch onto something. And it seems like what you're suggesting is that what it's latching onto is just the general desire to stay alive as long as possible. Well, that, that I was thinking specifically of the desire for eternal life. Sure. But, but I think you can do a kind of a version of that for whatever else C.S. Lewis was, was, was saying. Hmm. Um, uh, some people may have a, a, a sexual desire for, for a film star that they're never going to meet and wouldn't look at them if they did. And that doesn't mean that there's anything realistic about it. It's, it's, it's a natural extension of sexual desire. Of course, the film star exists. Well, it doesn't exist as, as, as in any <laughs> realistic sense as far as this, this wretched person is concerned. Who, sure. Who, um, I mean, you, you could, you could talk about a desire for 72 virgins in the Islamic heaven. Um, uh, that doesn't exist, um, um, but but it's easy to see it as as a projection of of an ordinary biological mm. desire. Yeah, I I mean I I tend to agree with you. Maybe if not in the detail with with that with the suggestion that the desire can be for something real, and that uh, the image of God or afterlife or eternality are just sort of warped or extended versions of a real thing. That is, you know, the afterlife yes. is an extension of the desire to be alive. I mean, a, a, a physicist might desire a solution to the theory of everything and the and the and the un, unity unification of gravity and quantum theory. Yeah, that's what C.S. Lewis says. They desire God. <laughs> you, you you desire a solution to a to a physical problem which may be insoluble and pulling your um, leg it, it, it's 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 be, it may be out of this world in the sense that it's beyond uh beyond solution mm. um i it, c.s lewis better come up with a better argument than that well c.s lewis has another argument for you which is the argument from reason and i actually yes. want to give you a version of it that yes. is more modern that, that i'm sure you'll have you'll have talked about before which is yes. alvin planting as evolutionary argument yeah. against naturalism i want to know what you think about this because um you know, I, I'm sat with one of the most preeminent evolutionary biologists in living memory, and I would, I would love to know what you think about this. Now, Plantinga points out that if we're a materialist, if we don't believe in the existence of a mind governing all of this, and everything evolves according to natural selection, well, what does natural selection select for? Survivability. Therefore, everything which evolves, evolves because it helps us to survive, including our minds including our rationality. And so why is it that we believe that evolution occurred by natural selection? Because we look at the evidence and we use our rationality to come to the conclusion that natural selection is the best explanation. But what we're doing in assenting to the truth of natural selection is saying that the mechanism we use to believe in natural selection doesn't actually select for truth. It selects for survivability. We can't know that two plus two equals four is true, or if it's just that believing two plus two equals four is beneficial for our survival. If the latter is the case, then we run into a lot of trouble. And it seems that when we say evolution is true, therefore our brain evolved for, for survivability, we've just undermined the truth aptness of the very process that we've used yeah, to believe in evolution. Yeah, I, I, I've never so understood what do you think why is? people are at all persuaded by this. Um, if we went through, if we, any animal went through life, particularly humans went, went through life, believing the equivalent of two plus two doesn't equal four, we would survive. I mean, you, you, if you base your life upon evidence, if you base your life upon, upon rationality, you're more likely to survive than if you base your life upon nonsense. Mm. And, and, um, it, it just seems to me to be so easy to say, um, that rationality and the search for truth, the search for, for, for evidence 
is a good way to live, even from a, a mundane Darwinian point of view. Mm. When, when you say a moment ago, um, if we were to live as if two plus two didn't equal four, I, I suppose what, what I'm saying is we have no way to ascertain whether it's actually true. I mean, you can, you can, are you saying something like, if the thing that we thought was true was not actually true, we just wouldn't be able to survive or, or something like that? Yes. Is it not conceivable that there could be things that we believe that are not true, but by believing them to be true actually make us more likely? Oh, yes. That, that's what, that, I mean, there is some evidence for that. Uh, there's some evidence that um, uh, having a somewhat inflated belief in your own ability is beneficial. Uh, right. Uh, and um, so uh, there, there's, there, there is evidence that, that people in general think they're better looking than they are, think mm -hmm. they're cleverer than they are, think they're better drivers than they are, et, et, et cetera. And there could be a certain, one, one, one at least could make an interesting case that uh, self-deception of this kind. Um, Robert Trivers, one of the great figures in my field, um, even wrote a book called The Folly of Fools mm. about self-deception. Uh, and the and the, um, the 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 Darwinian advantage of self deception. I think it's got to be pretty limited. I mean, uh, um, it it would it would be a little bit of a an icing, a little bit of a gloss on top of um, a fundamentally rational. Well, I think that's the that's the point that someone like Plantinga might wish to push back on, which is to say, how can we know that in some instances? Sure, believing something that's actually false is beneficial for our survival, and so we've evolved like a mechanism to just naturally think that it's true. But that definitely doesn't happen when we do math. So that definitely doesn't happen when we're sort of uh, doing empirical observation about you know the shape and size of things. We we know that that doesn't happen. Well, how how do we know that? Well, well we we know that science works. I mean, we know we we know that if you follow uh, scientific principles, you can you can hit you can get to Pluto. Hmm. Um, and and it works over and over and over again. You you cure smallpox. You you um, you you slingshot uh, r rockets around Venus and Earth and and, and get to Jupiter. Mm. Um, all all this all this works, and and scientific predictions come out right. You can predict when eclipses will occur. It 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 works. I suppose the analogy there would be somebody would ask. Well, then how do you know that two plus two equals four in the abstract mathematical realm is just true rather than it being the case that thinking or acting as if two plus two equals four helps us get to the moon? I think two plus two equals four is a different matter from getting to the moon. I mean, that, that's just logic. Well, I suppose, you know, mathematical truth and, and logic yes, in general. Yes. I'm, I'm using two Deduct plus two as a, as a truth. representative of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't see the problem with that. I mean, um, well, maybe there is one. Maybe yeah. there is. I, I just wanted to get your thoughts, and I suppose um, I'll be interested to see what people make of your reply. Um, one of the biggest reasons why people are religious, arguably, at least from a sort of cynical atheist perspective, is to escape the fear of death. Sigmund Freud said that there will be religion as long as we're afraid of death. Are you afraid of death? I'm afraid of dying. Um, I, I, I. I don't look forward to, I don't know, getting cancer or something of that, that sort. Um, I suppose I'm afraid of eternity. Um, I, I, it, it is a, a, a daunting thought that, that, that the universe goes on and on and on and on and on and on for billions, for trillions of years. Um, and uh, so... I've said this often enough before that that, that the, the the escape from eternity would be the escape from any kind of pain would be a general anaesthetic, uh, and and which I think is what death is. So uh, um, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a nothingness, just like a general anaesthetic. Um, I like life, and I like to go on living. I enjoy life, and I and I curious to know how the future will unfold. So I would like to go on. Mm. Um, so I wouldn't mind living for 200 years, um, but I wouldn't like to live for eternity. No. What consolation might you offer to, say somebody's read The God Delusion and they become convinced that God doesn't exist and there is no afterlife and they feel 
pretty fine about that, except for this one thing that they've now had to give up the idea that they're going to be able to escape death. And they, they, they say, well, I'm really happy for you, Professor Dawkins, that you're not afraid of death, but I still am. I'm afraid of the unknown. What advice would you give to them? It's very hard to say. I, 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 I'm under no obligation to give, to give any consolation, of course. Well, that's true. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I certainly think that, the, that the, the fact that a belief gives you consolation is no reason to think it's true. And what I care about is what's true. Um, I, uh, if they're not consoled by what I've just said about general anaesthetics, um, I have to scratch my head and try to think of something else, but I, I find it a hard, a hard job to do that. Um, I, I think that, uh, enjoy your life to the full while, while you've got it. Um, you won't regret it when you're dead because you won't be there. Um, so don't spoil your life by fretting about, about the fact that it's got to come to an end. Um, fill it with not not selfish pleasures, but fill it with with um, pleasure and pleasure in other with for other people as well. Mm. And perhaps its eternity would actually diminish its value in the sense that having a billion dollars in the bank account makes one dollar not worth worth very much. Uh, but if you've only got ten, then a dollar sort of becomes everything to you. Y yes, um, yes. Alexa Connor, thank you very much for coming on the Poetry of Reality. My pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.